Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Alexander Martin. I'm an archaeologist who specializes in the comparative study of ancient societies. Recently, I've begun studying how and why religious practices evolved for different types of populations. The first couple of questions we have to ask are, what is religion and what is it for? Uh, after all, there are a number of different elements that are often associated with religious behavior. Uh, among these, we can, we can think of uh, the belief in a god or the belief in gods. Uh, Often religion will give us rules of how to live a good life and what not to do. Uh, religion often has uh, involves some belief in, the, in nature, um, some believe in the nature of existence, uh, and some believe in our role within existence. Uh, there's also uh, some idea of an afterlife. Uh, we also know that religion often creates a strong sense of shared identity uh, and a strong sense of community. All of these are different elements that we often associate with religious behavior. So what we need to do is determine what are, you know, which out of all of these elements are common to all religions and, and which only occur in specific cases, in specific cultures, or spe for specific reasons. The aim here is that by doing this, we can learn more about what religion is, why do we practice it, and what is it for. So we begin by asking ourselves then, what element uh, is common to all religious uh, belief? And if we uh, spend a little, a little bit of time thinking about this, we realize that the thing that all religious be belief have in common is a belief in the supernatural, right? More specifically, there's the belief that some supernatural force or entity is behind natural everyday occurrences. So we think of some entity that has its own will or intent, that it's acting of its own accord, and it's behind natural everyday occurrences. Sometimes anthropologists will use the word agency to refer to this, this will or intent. This idea that uh, an agent, a free agent, is behind what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And as far back as we can, uh, as we can see archaeologically, um, all human, archaeologically and even historically, uh, all human groups have done this, have had these kinds of beliefs. In fact, there is even some debate to whether or not archaic homo sapiens like Neanderthals had these types of beliefs. So um, really these are very, these are very ancient uh, belief systems that all human beings share. Not just that, but all uh, cultures around the glo globe, as far as we, we are able to um, ascertain, uh, tend to have a belief in supernatural entities also. Um, sometimes we say that religion is a human universal. Uh, all, hu all, human being, all human groups um, have tended to have uh, reli robust religious systems of beliefs um, throughout history. It's essentially part of the human experience. So how do scientists make sense of this? To anthropologists, for example, um, this suggests that attributing intentionality to the natural world has to be something very, very important in, terms, in, in evolutionary terms, right? It must have been critical to our survival, right? Our species wouldn't be here today unless we had this tendency to attribute uh, intentionality to the natural world. Uh, that's why you see it uh, across uh, cultures and with uh, significant temporal depth. Uh, some, so this suggests that this tendency to attribute intentionality to the natural world must have been selected for. This means that to understand religion, we have to understand the evolutionary processes that would create these cognitive tendencies. So that leads us to, to realize that the evolutionary niche for our genus uh, during the last two million years of human evolution, uh, of evolution, was to increasingly understand what caused what in the environment. Causality. Uh, essentially, humans are fantastic. Humans and our, and our early um, hominid ancestors are great at figuring out what thing in the environment uh, c causes something else, right? More than any other creature on the planet, humans are very good at understanding and predicting causality. 
Um, it's really what makes us a, what made us uh, the most successful species on the planet. That's the thing that's behind our evolutionary success. For this reason, researchers have suggested that imagining natural forces as the motivations of discrete entities or spirits maybe allowed our species to better make sense of ecological causality. So essentially, the argument is that it might have made it possible to wonder, for early humans to wonder about what do those, fo what do those forces want? What are those forces in the environment that are applying pressure onto us? What are they trying to accomplish? Why are they doing what they're doing, right? Uh, by imagining natural forces as discrete entities with a motivation, uh, it allows us to wonder that. More importantly, uh, it allows us to kind of wonder, is there a way that I can change my behavior so that that force uh, does what I needed to do? Or even better, so that force leaves me alone and doesn't hurt me or my kin? Uh, example of these, the types of forces that might exert pressure onto the lives of early humans include things like thunderstorms, recurrent violence, bacterial infections, uh, just to name only a few. So this would have become symbolically represented as agency-wielding ghosts, spirits, deities in the minds of early humans, right? We still see uh, examples of this uh, with uh, present-day foraging populations. Ethnographies, ethnographers have been, one, have been great at really recording uh, a, num a number of uh, be, uh, religious behaviors for hunter-gatherer populations uh, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And uh, a recurrent example would be um, that a hunter-gatherer might carry out a rite after a fresh kill so that the spirit of the animal does not retaliate and make them sick. Uh, that's an example of how an environmental force uh, or something that humans come into regular contact with might become uh, represented as uh, an agency-wielding spirit. Now, it's important to realize that this biocognitive complex would not have evolved uh, purely for individual contemplation of the environment. Human beings didn't evolve individually. Human beings can't survive on their own. So it would have evolved uh, in the context of a, of a foraging band. Of, and foraging bands tend to, be, tend to have about 15 to 30 individuals, usually a closely related group of, of siblings, their spouses, their kids, maybe their parents. Um, that essentially is the size of a human group dur during the bulk of our uh, species evolution. So an important component of how this cognitive complex uh, to understand the environment as entities or forces, or as discrete entities or forces, would be that an older trusted member of the group, which the academic literature usually calls the shaman, um, would serve as the final interpreter of the desires and the appropriate reaction to that particular force of sp or spirit. Essentially, the group would have, would get together, would perform some ritual, and it would fall all, um, and th through this ritual, discuss or contemplate how to react to this environmental force that is exerting pressure onto the group but ultimately, a lot of the decisions on how, of how to uh, react to this force of spir or, or spirit would fall to an older, trusted member of the group called the shaman. The problem for anthropologists, however, is that this symbolic system of representations for hundreds, if not thousands, of phenomena is very culturally idiosyncratic and specific. Every culture uses different symbols to represent phenomena, and often, um, this large repertoire of symbols changes and expands and evolves by building on whatever previous symbolic representations were already present within that cultural system. This makes it very difficult to predict cross-culturally what specific symbols uh, will come to represent each type of phenomena for different populations. The problem's even worse for archaeologists, since this, since this symbolic representations resided primarily in the minds of individuals who can no longer be interviewed, 
and therefore can only be indirected, indirectly studied through the material remains of those representations, things such as paintings, statues, figuring idols, etc. So, how do researchers like me study the role of religion across different cultures? Not so much by looking at the specific symbolic representations, but by focusing on the ultimate aim of religious institutions, looking at what they are trying to achieve within each society, and specifically, how they rearrange people within a society to achieve specific goals. Let me explain. The main social unit for the discussion and dissemination of religious knowledge is what we call the congregation. Uh, a group of human beings get together and discuss um, natural phenomena and their symbolic representations. Uh, how we create a, this is essentially how we create a shared and share a similar symbolic understanding of the world. For hunter-gatherers, for foragers, the band is the congregation. A group of, uh, um, again, a group of siblings, their spouses, their kids, their, probably their parents. Uh, that's the group that gets together to, 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 to share a, uh, a similar understanding of the world and phenomena in it. So for the sake and purposes of, of understanding religion within foraging societies, we would say that the congregation is synonymous with the, with the foraging band. So the type of congregation that a society creates tells you a lot about the role of religion for that community. Uh, we even see this in present day religious communities. Um, so for example, um, hierarchical Christian denominations such as Roman Catholics tend to have much larger congregations than non-hierarchical ones like Anabaptists. This is because for Catholics, information is usually disseminated from the top down. By contrast, Anabaptists are more used to interpreting biblical scripture in a smaller community setting with more discussion, right? So we can apply these principles to prehistoric religious institutions as well. The best physical marker of a congregation is the assembly place, the actual location where people get together to discuss a shared understanding of the world uh, and their place in it. Archaeologically, the, this assembly location, this assembly place is, is wonderful because we can actually see traces of this in the archaeological record. We can measure it, we can count it, um, and we can do all sorts of things with that type of information. For example, some colleagues and I looked at where temple pyramids were in, rela in relation to communities for some Maya settlements. These settlements were part of a much larger regional state, um, a large polity that they all belong to. And when we counted up the number of households and the number of people per household in relation to each temple pyramid, we came up to a number of about 400 individuals per congregation. We then also did the same thing uh, for some Pueblo towns of the U.S. Southwest. These were independent towns that were not part of a large unified state. For this location, we counted out kivas, which are these small circular structures that are the center of ritual activities within each of the settlements. And when we carried, when we carried out a quantification of the number of household units within each settlement to the number of kivas, we came up with much smaller congregations. Uh, really, each congregation was about 20 to 40 people, accounted for about 20 to 40 people, really the size of about an extended family. So why this difference? It appears that for the politically decentralized Pueblo towns, congregations simply mapped themselves over existing extended family networks, while those of the regionally centralized Maya had to find some way to artificially pressure groupings of hundreds of anonymous individuals. The aim here probably being to unify different villages under a similar doctrine. This suggests that these two types of religious meeting locations probably serve very different social roles. As mentioned earlier, our predispositions for religiosity seem to have originally developed as an evolutionary adaptation for making sense of the environment within a small group setting. It appears that in the absence of large states that incorporate the communities of a region, religious institutions continue to be strongly focused on that task, which is reflected in their congregation size, which will be largely synonymous with the close kin extended family. However, once the more complex types of communities appear, such as large regional states and empires, religious institutions are increasingly used to buttress those more complex polities. 
which in turn require sometimes drastic changes to the nature and size of their religious congregations. This is just an example of how a researcher like me might tackle some of these issues. But ultimately, anthropology is a holistic discipline, and it takes the collaboration of cultural anthropologists, linguistic anthropologists, physical anthropologists, and archaeologists to put together a complete picture of the role of religion in human society. Thank you very much.